Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Are we feeling refreshed this morning? Not tired or anything? <laughs> well, the difference between immortality and mortality. Can you imagine there's quite a bit of difference there? There is, isn't there? No more feeling tired, lethargic. You wouldn't know it. Well, maybe you do, but yesterday I was absolutely shattered. I, I couldn't believe how tired I was. I had invisible toothpicks in my eyes, keeping them open yesterday. It was just so... I couldn't believe it, like the time difference between Australia and here. But today I feel good. It may last ten minutes, I don't know. <laughs> but that, that's mortality. I just figure that is mortality. Everything about mortality is redoing, isn't it? Refueling. Refurbing, refurnishing, going over and over and over with, with things. Do you, uh, does anybody here like mowing lawns? Yeah, there's there's always problem people in every audience. <laughs> I, in a, like for some people, it can be quite cathartic to mow lawns. For me, I find it intensely irritating. I don't know what it is, but. Where we come from, the lawn it can grow up to this high. You have nice grass here, it's lush, it's beautiful. But ours, we live in a, uh, I don't know if it's too unlike here, it's, we don't ever get snow, that's, that's for sure. But we live in a humid area and you push that mower, it grows up behind you. <laughs> and there's no end to it. It's just over and over and over again. And this, that's all about mortality. And there's a, there's a good illustration if we... We'll just go back there if you're not there already in 2 Corinthians 5 because Paul picks up this idea in, uh, in chapter 5 and he relates it with this vivid metaphor which is unbelievable and it's highly educated for us. We know that if the tent... That is our earthly home. That's just a tent... If it's destroyed, we have a building from God, a house, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For this tent, for in this tent, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked, for while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. Now, does anybody know where that analogy is drawn from in the Old Testament? What's it built on? I won't mock if it's wrong, I promise. <laughs> I'm those kid, one of those kids who used to always answer the uh, rhetorical questions <laughs> and get them wrong when I was young. The idea of a tent and burdened. It's the tabernacle, absolutely. I know that you all knew it, maybe just feeling a little bit nervous this morning. It's the tabernacle. You think about that. That's what Paul says... That is like mortality. Israel, they had to lug all of that with Kohath, Merari and um, Gershon all through the wilderness for 40 years. They had to carry it on their backs and on carts and by hand. And every time they, they set it all up and then the, uh, the pillar of fire would shift. And people, I, I can imagine people go, I had to pack it all up again and put it on their backs and carry it 10 kilometres and set it all up again. That's mortality, burdened, lugging it around all the time. Nothing like the heavenly dwelling. And I, I believe that's likened to the Temple of Solomon. Something established and solid, which is meant to last forever in, in the metaphor. Does anybody here like camping, though? Does anybody like camping? Well, see, I don't. <laughs> it's not that I, well, I did up to a point when I was a child, but then Dad used to take us on these camping trips, and he had this, he had this, oh, 
You could never buy another tent like it. It was unique. It had about 53 rooms and it was impossible to set up. Unlike, you'd have the, uh, the main um, tent, the ridge poles, thank you, that went on loops on the outside. Oh, no, not this one. You had to crawl and burrow like a rabbit inside in 40 degree heat, which is over 100 degrees here. And there was always scissor paper rockers to which child would go in. And we'd all promise not to jump on top of them when you're in there. And it was the most disturbing and claustrophobic experience you could ever have. But that, that's my camping trip, I remember. And Dad, from the moment we got out of the car and all we wanted to do was play, he would start yelling at us and, and calling us all sorts of names and how useless we were. And, <laughs> and, and then three or four hours later, it took forever to, pa to set this thing up. And finally when it was done, Dad would say, like two days later, all right, let's pack it up again, put it in the boot of the car, home. That's mortality to me. A weekend camping trip, and I, <laughs> it's never fun. Ever fun. That's all the memories I have of it. It is mortality. That's what Paul says. It's unlike the building from God. Perpetual. Not made with hands. Eternal. In the heavens. That's what our lives are now. I mean, who wants to live forever, brothers and sisters? Look how the, look how the scriptures uh, talk about our lives now. Psalm 144. What is description of our wonderful life? Vanity and a shadow. James calls it a vapour. If you boiled the, the jug this morning and you saw that last rush of vapour, that's your whole life, 70 years there. The best life that you could imagine. James relegates it to nothing more than a vapour. I mean, I don't like hearing that because I think my life's worth more than that. God says, you're just vanishing. Without me, any, any attachment to me, whatever, that is all that we are. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Psalm 103, it doesn't get any more um, complimentary through the scriptures. Dust and grass. Genesis calls us ashes, and 1 Corinthians 15 is not complimentary at all. Corruption, dishonour, weakness, earthy. A natural body. Mortality. Like who wants to live forever, brothers and sisters? And every day goes by, we're getting closer and closer to eternity. As long as we stay, we're going to see attached to this word. Who wants to live forever? I mean, I want to live forever. I'm sick of this place. Not Paris Avenue. I mean, I'm sick of it. Um, <laughs> just generally life. Not in any depressed way, but you just want so much for the kingdom to come. I mean, don't you? Don't you want that? You choose a subject like the return of Christ and you start getting into it. Then you, you think, well, there's so many other subjects that we could look at, like spend a couple of nights on the kingdom and what it will be like. But the weekend's all over so quick. One more talk and it's, it's finished. You think that's typical of mortality. We never have enough time. There's never enough time at all. And the problem is with us, when we look at that there, we think, no, no, that's not what my life's like. And it's not what their life is like out there. And we have this strange vul vulnerability in the truth for brothers and, si uh, what are we? brothers and sisters. We have this, this predisposition to imagine that life outside is just buzzing. And it's happening out there. And we're the ones that are missing out on everything, you know? They're leading a life that's so fun and glorious. And there's quotes like Psalm 73, which we know about, Asaph, Psalm, and Job 21, where both those men, righteous, holy men who had faith, they also saw their own susceptibility to looking at the wicked and thinking, everything for them goes right. And everything in the truth is so hard and burdensome. And out there, it's as if their life goes on forever. In other words, they, they seem to have party after party, like a revolving door. Festival. They give birth to children. They watch their children grow to such an old age. They don't have any pain or responsibility throughout their life. And their life is snuffed out in an instant without any remorse at all. That's what Job says. Asaph says basically the same thing. He looks at it and thinks, why can't my life be like that? And we know what 
Asaph does, he takes, goes around the whole circle. Does anybody remember what he says? Finally he comes back to, goes back to the sanctuary of God, thinks, hold on, what am I talking about? It's so brief. I remember it's just a vapour. And then it comes to an end. And if it was, say if it was the best life you could ever imagine, the best life where nothing went wrong. You grew up with elite sports prowess and intelligence which no man had ever matched, better than Einstein and better hair as well. And, and you married somebody that was your counterpart, equal, and the whole world was at your feet. And you had absolutely everything. You got to 70 years old and your extended family was all there for your, uh, your birthday. And then it just finished and it's completely over. And that's, easy, that's the best that you can get. And you and I know in our sober moments, brothers and sisters, that no life out there is ever quite that good, is it? No life is ever that good, but we imagine that it is. They all sit around in coffee houses and they've got no responsibility at all just joking and laughing and gossiping with one another. It's not like that. And even if it was, it's just so brief. It makes you shudder how brief it is. And God says, but if you can just last a little while, yours is trial and tribulations just for a little bit, and it will go on forever. That's immortality. And immortality is nothing like the best life now. The enthusiasm and the connection and the joy and the praise and the blessing and grace of immortality is so far beyond the most incredible experience that you could possibly have on earth at this time. One second of immortality will beat 70 years of the best life now, but we don't believe it. And we think, oh. No, I just don't. It's so hard being in the truth. It's a burden. We groan. It's difficult. The first time this really came home to me was a, it was a young, first of all, just a young man at our hall became a brother. But he had, like we've all been touched with brothers or sisters in our families maybe or in our ecclesias that have had you know, a debilitating disease. And he had, it was just shocking disease. The whole ecclesia was praying for him. And he went through the treatment. All his hair had fallen out and he looked an absolute mess. He really did. But people, we never stopped and it, it seemed like such a blessing. He had this brief remission. He got baptised. The ecclesia were buoyed that you know, success and God's blessing. And he was... Uh, it was amazing, actually, because for, for a few months there, he was like a, a little dynamo powerhouse in the truth. And uh, he goes back to the doctor when he was sick one time. We've all heard stories like this, but it's true, and it really hit me because the doctor said, yes, I'm sorry, the tests have come back and your body is completely riddled with the disease and you have so long to live. And I remember the last time I saw him, I was, on, I was doing deliveries actually, this before I started teaching, and I was doing deliveries there and um, I stopped into his house for lunch and I sat with him for about an hour and we were laughing about all sorts of things and talking about life now and we were looking at Philippians about our vile bodies being swallowed up and consumed for that glorious body and I was just we had talked about a talk that he'd done before on resurrection and his his mind had basically just narrowed to one point and all he could think about was that one thing to get immortality he looked at himself and it was just degenerate it was gone and we were talking and laughing and I remember him saying yeah no Matt I'm uh, I'm going to shave my head again and I joked, I said, what are you going to shave it for? It's only just grown back. And he just, he, just, he just lifted his hand and just grabbed a tuft of hair like that and this whole heap just came out of his hands. And I'll never forget it. He goes, I've had it, man. And I had, I had to go outside. I'd say goodbye to him. That's the last time I saw him and I went out and had a little tear outside in my truck and um, I couldn't believe it. It just hit me. I was looking at him and he was just a speeded up version of what I am. I'll follow him in his physicality. It might take me 70 years to get there. 
but it is ex exactly the same, isn't it? It's exactly the same. We've all seen that before. But his faith was incredible. And I know I was at the funeral and I took Todd, he was only four at the time. We looked down into that hole and I remember telling my son, God will bring him out of there. And I believe it. He'll stand with God and Christ in immortality. He won't have a vile body anymore. He's going in a way which will end in indestructibility. That's the way I want to go. That's the way you want to go, brothers and sisters. And sometimes we forget how good it's going to be and we start to imagine, oh, it's just so good outside and it's not good outside. And many of us may not think, young people particularly, may not think we have to grasp hold of immortality now because we feel six foot tall and bulletproof and the world is at our feet. But we have to remember stories like this and the echoes of the Bible, which clearly tell us, no, in your youth, young man, follow after righteousness. Follow God now. There may not be a tomorrow. It can all end so quickly. And so we ask ourselves, do we want to live forever? I mean, we all want to. We do. Even, even those people outside in their sober moments, you know they really want to live forever. The mate I was talking about at home, he does want to live forever. When times are good, they don't want to talk about things which cause reflection or sober them up, do they? But in times where just a, a few weeks ago there was somebody in our town who took his own life and I knew him. He was what you would call, for want of a better word, outside, as somebody who I knew, knew more than an acquaintance. He was a friend. But his life had just, it, it had just fallen apart almost overnight dramatically and he couldn't find himself a better path. And he knew who I was. He used to always say, I'll oh, say hello to the Christadelphians for me. And he would joke about life and he seemed to have it all together. It end, ended his life. There's no hope out there. All his friends were asking questions at the funeral like, what does it mean? What's our life mean? He was like, he was like the life of the party. They've got nothing. They live on a knife edge in their excitement and they can go from up there, down there in a flash. They all want to live forever. They all do. I, I think about, you know, Walt Disney. I know it's not true, but I like the story anyway. But this is true for other people. Does anybody hear what Walt Disney supposedly done? I don't think he has. I think he's cremated. But there are other people I read about that have done it. They had themselves cryogenically frozen in the hope that, you know, with sufficient advances in technology down the track a little bit, maybe, maybe they could advance technology to a point where they could um, thaw them and reanimate them. And we laugh at that because it's never going to happen. But they believe it, they hope. Why, why would you bother? Because they don't want to die. They want to endure. They want to live forever. They don't, want to, they don't want to die. They don't want to cease. Darkness, no feeling, nothing forever. That's claustrophobic. That's mortality. Does anybody know who was voted the greatest athlete last century? The greatest athlete. <laughs> That's your first incorrect answer. <laughs> Still 99% though. Surely. No one gets it in Australia, but it, it, okay, it's American. Muhammad Ali. That's it. Muhammad Ali. Does anybody know what, you know what his great catch cry was? Actually, he had a few, but... Yeah, not that once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to me, this the one I've got is like the greatest one. Is there anybody? He murdered a rock and put a brick in the hospital. Yeah, I know. I like that one too. <laughs> yeah, it's not that one either. <laughs> yeah, that's the next one, I think. <laughs> what about the one where he said, I don't want no pie in the sky? Well, we only know this in Australia. Are you serious? <laughs> okay, his greatest thing that he said was, I don't want no pie in the sky. I want something here on the ground while I'm still around. Have you not heard that? You better Google that one in. <laughs> Muhammad Ali said that. It's true. He said it. 
and we know what he's got now. He's, he's a tottering old man, but, you know, I'm going to make a comeback. That's him. That's what he thinks. He, lo- he would love to just whisk himself away 30, 40 years before. Go back, wouldn't he? Where everybody, all the world, were just screaming out his name. Nobody thinks about him anymore unless you're writing, you know, a historical paper at school or something. He's gone. He would want to live forever. Ask him, are you happy with what life's given you now? Are you satisfied just watching reruns of your famous victories? Does that do it for you anymore? Or would you like to go back to the glory days? What would you like to do? I mean, come on, brothers and sisters, and there's one of the best lives you could ever get. No more elite sportsman than that. It's incredible. Do we want to live forever, brothers and sisters, in real joy? As we said, real connection with one another. No longer wracked with anxiety or problems in our life. We're going to be connected with, with one another. God is actually going to invite us into eternal fellowship with himself. Where the process has just begun. Now, what is immortality? Here's how the scripture talks about it. An eternal weight of glory. An eternal weight of glory. It's a little different, isn't it, to uh, ashes and a vapour. An eternal weight. A great reward. Full. A full reward and satisfying. I like those those descriptions of immortality. And if you ask me, like, like, what is it really? I don't know. How can a mortal person, a human, articulate or explain what God is? How can they? How can you describe what the, the nature of the universe's father actually is? We, don't, we know this, that we're going to be like him because one day we'll see him. We will be like him. He'll share with us his underived immortality. That life that can't be taken away. And once it's given, you have it forever. Imagine that. This is what the uh, scriptures uh, talk about it in terms of... There's the word, Athanasia, the, word, the Greek word for immortality. Deathless. And it's used of God's nature. Is God the only one who has immortality? Well, the answer is no. The angels have it as well, but not underived. If it weren't for the Father, they would not have it. They only have it because of him. They're part of him. Can you comprehend that? I can't comprehend that. But he's promised it to us. Another noun is incorruption. An unending existence. And the thing is with this word here, just think about that. It has a tinge of morality to it. It's actually more than a tinge. It's more than a flavour and a colour to it. You see, this, this unending existence, which this body, this built, indestructible, dynamic body of immortality, is based on a character, isn't it? It is based on a character. It's based on holiness and righteousness and love and grace. Remember what Moses calls it in Exodus 33 and 34? He speaks of it in terms of a pathway. He calls it the way. Remember that? Show me now the way. When you were Moses there, beset with all of Israel around you, trying to get them to the uh, promised land, and you say to God, show me the way, like how we're going to get there, I would have expected God to show Moses some massive um, display of power. Amalek's in front of us, Sion and um, the, the uh, Amorites and the Amalekites. Lord, how are we going to smash through them? Show me some power, show me the way. And God says, they're not the ones keeping you out of the promised land. It's not them at all. It's nothing. You need grace. You need mercy. You need long-suffering. You need my abundant goodness and truth because the only thing keeping you out of the promised land is your own sin. And so the way to immortality is a way of life. It's a way of living. It's a way of service 
in the Acts of the Apostles, they persecuted those of that way. This is what immortality is actually based on. It's a way of living and a pathway, and it's a straight and narrow way, which if you remain in the way, brothers and sisters, it's inevitable and inescapable that you will end up possessing a dynamic and indestructible body of immortality. It's as simple as following a road map without deviation to the destination and you'll arrive there in the end. This is, this is the instruction book on that way and we've got to stay close to this book. It's brought out in um, Isaiah 40. If you wouldn't mind just turning there with me, please. Because we've got a big problem, haven't we? Our big problem is, well, our bodies now just tend to break down. Paul says, the good that I want to do, it just doesn't seem to happen. I set out to do good and then I sin. I set out to be kind and I'm a nasty person. I set out to be really, really patient and then I want to strangle the kids. What's wrong with me? It's so hard to stay on this way and it is narrow. And we're going to see, like God's not interested in uh, attainment. That is, does he expect you to be perfect? Of course not. Are you going to be perfect? You're going to be sorry. God is interested in our direction. And our direction is we're looking towards God. We see along that path and we just keep on heading. We fall over and over and over and over again. But with his help, he'll pick us up, set us on our feet, put us back on the way, keep us in the way, hedge us about, herd us towards the kingdom. We're hopeless. But our direction is righteousness. Our direction is holiness. Our direction is service. And if our direction is facing the Lord, we're going to be there, brothers and sisters. You might have heard it um, explained before, you know, how we need Christ, that all our life we struggle and we strain in that way and we're, we're running headlong to the kingdom. The finish line's just there and we just dive out to the finish line and we can't make it. And we're so close. But thankfully for Christ, he reaches the cross and he drags us into immortality. And we thank him and we say, Lord, without you, I couldn't have done it. And we think that's the metaphor, brothers and sisters. There's nothing like that. All our life we struggle and strain and we care for the ecclesia and we serve and we do the best that we possibly can. And we're running all our life towards the promised land to eternal life. And when we die... When our journey ends, we look up and the finish line is a million miles still that way. And the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, reaches down from eternity all the way back to you where you are and you turn around and you haven't even taken one step off the starting line and Christ reaches down and brings you all the way back to himself and God from that point. That's what our Lord Jesus Christ does for us. Don't worry about being perfect, brothers and sisters. It's the way. We've got ourselves on that way. Righteousness is the direction. It's not attainment. God will work that one out. Forgiveness is easy for him. We're genuine about our, our absolute determination to try and do what's right. Of course it will clean up our lives, but we're never going to do it ourselves. Isaiah 40. We usually turn to this chapter, don't we, to prove what? What do we normally go to Isaiah chapter 40 for? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And what does John always tell us? All flesh is grass. All flesh is grass. You're, you're grass. You're just a fading blade of grass. And I go... Now I'm depressed. The chapter doesn't, it's not about depression. Look at the chapter. Comfort, comfort ye my people. This chapter is about comfort. And yet I've fallen into that category many times of cho choosing to quote from this chapter merely to prove that we're all going to die and that we're fading away and there's nothing to mortality, which is only half the story. Verse 6, a voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. It's true. And all its beauty is like the flower of the field. 
The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of Yahweh blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades. Look, we know that, brothers and sisters. No one's arguing. There's 6,000 years of humans who are dead, 153,000 to be statistically precise, every single day just shuffle off this earth. 153,000. Do you think anybody cares or takes any second thought? Nobody's going to remember us. I don't even need that verse to tell me that. But it does. But that is only half of it. The flip side is this. And this is the comfort. This is what the chapter was written for. You all know that you're just a blade of grass. Even the best of us. Who's, who, who would be the most intelligent and the physically greatest in this hall? <laughs> there must be somebody who is just like elite. Brother Caleb? <laughs> I take it from your response you don't think so. <laughs> well, if it were, and if he was in the category of Muhammad Ali, if he was, God says, but that's fine, all flesh is grass and the beauty the best that man can produce, the greatest. It's like the flower of the field. And the grass withers, but you know what? For a time, the grass is there and the beautiful Caleb-like flower, you know, (laughs) towers over all. But the sun comes up by midday in the mid-afternoon and the grass is withered down and the flower has faded too and we are all just been equalised. And for a time we thought, oh, if only I could be like that. And God says, you're all the same. There's no difference. The breath of Yahweh blows on it. Here's the flip side. This is the comfort. Verse, verse 8. The word of our God will stand forever. Brothers and sisters, the word of our God stands forever. We've got to get attached to that word. That's what will make us live forever. Do you know that there, this this word, brothers and sisters, is the greatest and most advanced technology for reanimation? It's here. You don't need to be frozen. You get yourself attached to this. This is the comfort of the scriptures. God says in verse 9, get to a high mountain, Zion, herald the good news, lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald the gospel. This is what it's about. Your God, who comes with might, he rules and he brings the reward, the reward of eternal life. For you, to you who are but dust and ashes, who are but grass and failing and withering, God says, if you're attached to this word, you're getting closer every single day to eternity. I find that incredible. That's immortality. That's what Isaiah 40 is about. And it ends with, look how it ends. They that wait on Yahweh shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary and walk and not faint. Yahweh is an everlasting God. And he creates things to last forever. And he wants us to last forever, brothers and sisters. You know, when I was delivering, I, we've had bad days. All of us have had bad days, haven't we? I remember this particularly really bad day and I had an altercation with the boss. I'd got a flat, I had to take a a truck an hour and a half, drive one way down the road and then bring another one back. And I I had a flat tyre and um, things had gone wrong with the kids that day. What else had gone wrong? Those things are true so far, but let's embellish, let's make a really bad day. What else could go wrong? (laughs) I got a speeding ticket before I'd even started driving and, and um, <laughs> the lawn got torn up. My, my famous garden got torn up by you know a wild pack of dogs. I don't garden, by the way, but it, it, that, it was just terrible what had happened this day. You understand, like, this is a really bad day. So I get in my, I get in my truck and, like, I just don't care about life at the moment. I just want to turn the radio on up loud and just you know, drown myself, just sit there sullenly for an hour and a half and think about how bad the world is to me. 
you know, we, we've all had our little pity parties. And, uh, and I, I'm a rebel at heart, and being the eldest as I am, like, the eldest is fiercely independent, hates being told what to do, and back of my head was saying, yeah, do it, do it, just listen to the radio. And I remember consciously thinking, hey, who said that? No, I'm not going to listen to you, the flesh, telling me what to do, listen to the radio. So I stuck my iPod in and I went to, you know, the voice of the Bible, Alexander Scorby. Has anybody got the Bible on there? If you've got, has anyone got iPods? Young people, if you've got iPods, or brothers and sisters, you've got to put the Bible on it. I think it's a sin to have your iPod without the Bible on it. I do, because if you're going to use it for your music, which you all probably do, you've got to put something decent on it, don't you? So I sat it in there and I put in the gospel to Luke, of Luke. And I started listening to it. For the first 20 minutes, brothers and sisters, I didn't hear anything. I was just, just sitting there thinking about all the things I should have said and what ought to have happened that day. But it was playing there in the background. But what happened was it was pushing itself to the front of my mind and all my evil thoughts about pitying for myself slowly relegated themselves to the back. And it was sort of an imperceptible sort of event that happened. And before I knew it, I was front and centre with what was happening in Luke. The experiences of the Lord and the things that he said and who he spoke to and where he went and what he did and the miracles that he performed. And it's amazing when you get a whole chronological flow like that. And it took me exactly the length of time. By the time I turned it on, got the truck, took the first journey and came back, just as I was entering the limits of our town, it just closed the book of Luke. And I had completely changed from a legion-like, you know, unclothed man to a sane, well-dressed person in their right mind. It just had this incredible um, ameliorating effect over me. It was amazing. And when I got home that night, I was so nice to my wife and I had all the time in the world for the kids and we, we did the readings and we talked about it and we played games and I slept well that night. And I just can't believe it. It has a powerful effect on us. It does. Incredibly. I know brothers who have it playing in their studios all their life, just 24-7, just the Bible in the background, and that must familiarise yourself with that word, brothers and sisters. You think about how powerful that would be. So if you do have those things, do something about it. Make use of it. Because every time you read a page or a verse of this, this book here, you're getting yourself closer to immortality. It's true. It's an amazing concept, isn't it? Getting closer and closer to reanimation. Now, when you think about it, we're the only ones in the world that actually have a taste for immortality because we've developed a taste for the character and the qualities of our Heavenly Father. I mean, people out there, you try and tell them how good immortality is, but they think, no, 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 I've got today, I've got now. It's so much better. Why would I want to give this up? Why? Why? In fact, there was an older brother who was doing a, um, some, some park preaching a few years back in, uh, in Sydney, Australia, and uh, this old drunk had sat down beside him when he was trying to preach to everybody, and he put his sandwich on his shoe, the brother who's speaking, his shoe, and he was unwrapping his you know, brown paper bag, uh, eating away and drinking and so forth, and he's talking about immortality in the kingdom. And this drunk interrupted while he was speaking, looked up and, you know, what, you mean I've got to give up my booze and my fags and my women? And this brother who was like, where'd that come from? He went, oh, well, you won't be needing it in immortality. And he says, ha, if that's your immortality, you can keep it. And I think to myself, a dishevelled, lonely, stinking mess of a person. And he says, no, immortality's got nothing for me. If that wasn't such a sad picture, that would be absolutely hilarious. And I actually do think on reflection it's pretty funny myself, but, <laughs> but you, that's what they're like, such is the grunt of the sow. They have nothing, they want nothing, just what's here and now. They want now. It's disturbing, brothers and sisters. Is it a quarter past we have to finish? Yeah. Sorry, Brother Jim. Um, 
some other words there. There's a uh, nice adi adjective which uh, describes it. Immortality can't decay or corrode. I like that. There's no maintenance in immortality. Actually, I really like that. Eternal life, aeonos, aeonos zoe. It's the life of the age. It's not different. Not at all. It's not different to immortality. Exactly the same. It's just, it's not telling us so much about the length or the duration of uh, the life. It's telling us more about the epoch of its distribution. God will distribute immortality in the age. He will give us the Zoe at the beginning of the millennium and he'll give it to some at the end of the millennium. That's all that means. We can talk more about that later. So here's some qualities of immortality. I got these, a lot of these from a brother years ago and I've added to them since and uh, you could probably help me add more and there's some obviously that we haven't got up there but just think about them. All of those wonderful characteristics and qualities, some appeal more to the young at certain stages of, stage of your life and some appeal more to the old, like the one we read from Isaiah chapter 40 about running and never feeling weary again. Pick one, somebody. What do you want to talk about? We haven't got much time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, that, that is the Isaiah quote, inexhaustible energy. That's the point, exactly. I still, I'm sort of merging into that category now when I run and play sports with the kids. I feel it for a week afterwards. I never used to feel it for a week. I have to warm up now. I didn't have to warm up before. In immortality, no warm-ups. Why I never feel bad? Inexhaustible energy. Walking and not ever being weary. No sleeping. The immortal community will never have to sleep. Ever. In the millennial age, when all the mortals go to bed at night, Brother Roberts in his final consolation talks about, you know, those booths that we may stand in for the night. I'm not going to stand in any booth, I can tell you that. But Brother Roberts painted a wonderful picture. That's fine. My immortality, I'll be into the temple with um, an amazing faculty of movement. Can you imagine that? So we might get taken back to your uh, Paris Avenue perhaps or in this area of America or some other part of the world, it doesn't matter. You have a vision of where you'll be, I may be back in my hometown, but at night when everything's peaceful and quiet, we could be in the kingdom, in the temple. And I may have and I will have a, uh, a uh, meeting, an appointment with John the Apostle because he's going to take me over a period of you know, a few years through Revelation. We're going to talk about it and unfold the scroll and he'll take me through reruns and show me what he saw and I'll be able to stop and say, John, but when you saw that, what were you thinking when you saw that? What did you make of that there? And he'll say what he thought and I'll say, this is how it fitted in history. And we'll go through these things together. That's incredible. But, oh, look, time's flown. We've got to go back to where we came from with our amazing faculty of movement. That quote in Daniel 9 there is of... Uh, Gabriel that flew swiftly to Daniel. From where? From God. Where's God? I don't know. But we can't get there. You can't buy a ticket. Not on a plane. Incredible. Anything else up there? No anxiety, exactly. Peace and calm with real joy and not, not having any lingering doubts in the back of your mind whether people will like me or accept me or whether I fit into this place. You fit in because you're connected to God. God's in the centre and like wheel, like the spokes on a wheel, where the rim on the outside, we're not connected because of the rim on the outside, we're connected because we all go back to our Heavenly Father and we'll feel that and we'll know that. That's immortality. It's so different from now. One that's not up there, which I particularly um, have at my heart, is being able to sing. That would be fantastic. See, you wouldn't know it, but I can't sing. And in Lismore, I am an absolute laughing stock. In fact, my friends, my best friends, can you believe this? My best friends, when they... Years ago, they actually organised to get singing lessons and they didn't even call me. They thought I was so far behind and so disabled that 
he'll only hold us back. <laughs> they didn't even call me. And I, you know, I got over it. But I would love to be able to sing, be in the temple and be singing properly. Actually, it reminds me, I hope you don't laugh at this story because it really hurts my feelings. But <laughs> um, I was, was speaking the truth to this interested friend and he turned up unexpectedly to the hall, out of the blue. And I was, oh, I couldn't believe it, you're actually here and you always feel unprepared and you think, oh no, I hope everybody's nice to him and everything. We sat at the back of the hall and I was singing probably uncharacteristically louder than normal. And I found out afterwards, when he, be, he became a brother, this, uh, this, this young man, and he actually uh, appreciates Pavarotti. <laughs> and there's a bit little difference between myself and Pavarotti. And, and we sat down, and I was so excited for singing this hymn this day, and we sat down, and he just pointed to him, he goes, I bet that's your um, favourite hymn, isn't it? I looked at it and I went, mm, not really, why? And he pointed to the line that said, soon shall victory tune your song. <laughs> I thought, I can't believe you're laughing at that. I still bear the scars. But in the kingdom, it'll be different. I will be able to sing. I'm not going to have to have lessons for a thousand years. I'll be in the choir and the conducting angel or saint. He won't be saying, oh, uh, Brother Matt, could you just uh, smell the words, please? He won't be saying anything like that. And I look forward to that day to be able to sing. Because I've got many bad stories about my singing these days. What about, what about limitless strength? Who knows what that quote's about? Just here. What's the context there? Um, yes. 185,000 Assyrians. The flower of the then known world, the massive military might of Assyria had Israel by the neck and God sends one angel to deal with them, just one. I just love that. He doesn't even touch them. Uh, Byron says he just breathes on the face of the foe as he passes, just took their breath from them. 185,000, all Israel were trembling in their boots saying, what are we going to do? And God says, just you, you, you go and deal with it. One angel. That's the power of immortality. Have you ever heard, brothers and sisters, we give public lectures, and it's true, we don't have the Holy Spirit gifts now, but in the kingdom they'll return. You think about that for a second. That's not entirely true, is it? We're going to be given much, much, a million times more than the Holy Spirit gifts. They were they're called just a taste, just a fleeting taste of the powers of the age to come. We're going to be given so much more than the Holy Spirit gifts in the kingdom. The apostles who had the Holy Spirit gifts, brothers and sisters, they couldn't blow mountains out of the ground, turn the tide of nations. They couldn't do anything like that. But we'll be able to do that, every one of you in the kingdom. That's immortality, the difference between now and then. Absolutely amazing. The thought of it, isn't it? Brother Roberts describes it as to be mantled in the immortal strength of a glorified nature. It's like a coat. Imagine putting on that sort of a coat. Imagine that coat hanging on your back and shielding you forever against the, you know, the blighting effects of mortality. What a great day that is. You know, when you start to think about it and talk about it with one another, you think, oh, you feel so small entertaining the idea that outside is a life which is my envy, which I'm actually jealous of and I could pursue if I want. Why would I want that? Who wants it? Don't you want immortality, brothers and sisters? That's what I want, and I'm sure you do too.